You are a Locked On Braves postcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. Hello and welcome into the Braves postcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Grant McCauley alongside Jake Mastriani after yet another frustrating night for the Atlanta Braves who are looking for momentum coming off of a series win against the Cincinnati Reds. Facing the lowly Miami Marlins, they of last place in the National League East, and the Braves were unable to handle their business in a 4-3 loss as the Marlins jumped ahead early and did not look back on their way to a 4-3 victory over Atlanta in the first of a three-game series. And we'll talk all about it. The days are running out. They're getting ripped off the calendar very quickly. And for the Braves, this one represents a very large missed opportunity on a night that one of your wild card foes Lost a game, you're unable to pick up some ground, and again, the clock is ticking. We're going to talk all about it, how it happened, and of course, get you set up for Saturday's Game 2 of the series as well. Hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube, and subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel, and now through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started with that. Jake, I don't know how many times we have done this kind of show this year, but I would wager a guess as to it being too many. And at this point, the Braves can't afford more losses like this, particularly against a team that has been buried in the standings for a very long time, a club that has no aspirations of doing too much in 2024, but they might just cost the Braves a chance to do something special by losing a game to the Miami Marlins, a game that quite simply you had to have. You had to, and we talked about it coming in. It's a a series that really you needed to sweep because you put yourself in the spot by losing games to the Marlins, to the Nationals, to the White Sox, to the Rockies. I mean, it's all season long. It's just magnified now because you're doing it at the most crucial point of the season, and it's the same thing. Again, like you said, we've had this podcast over and over. If if there's something to be put on the tombstone of this season, which might be getting engraved at this very moment, it's they couldn't get the big hit, and that was, again, the case tonight. Yeah, well, I don't know if the Braves necessarily bought the life insurance to cover all of those things. They certainly need insurance for the injuries they've dealt with over the course of the season. But all jokes aside, I said this on social media. I mean, it just feels like, you know, uh, just another nail on the proverbial coffin of the Braves playoff hopes because they have only eight games left after this and they did need to sweep the Marlins. And this is a club that's 40 games under 500 after this win, Jake. I mean, this is not a good baseball club. It doesn't mean every once in a while they're not going to win. You know, every dog has his day. A broken clock is right twice a day. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things you can say. Blind squirrel, all that stuff. But the the Braves were in a place right now, especially coming off such a big win over the Reds. You were hoping there might be that carryover effect, maybe a little energy from Ozzie Albies coming back, which we'll discuss a little bit later, and the way that the lineup was constructed for that matter. But you just couldn't afford another misstep on this road trip. They had one immediately losing in Cincinnati. Now they roll into Miami, and they have another one. And even though the Mets lost to the Phillies on this night, The Braves remain two games out of that final wild card spot, and they're running out of days. They are, and I said coming into it, you got to get to at least within a game going into that Mets series. This was your opportunity to do that. Of course, you got a couple more chances because at least if you do that, obviously they still control their own destiny, but you don't want to go in there having to hope for a sweep. But Mm -hmm. you go in at least one game back, you got a chance to win that series and own the tiebreaker. But you you had to, like you said, this isn't a good Marlins team, and you know they're not. They're not trying to fool anybody out there with the with the players, the lineup, the roster that they have. The lame duck manager right now essentially just doesn't want to come back. Yeah. I mean, this is this is not a good team that is basically just playing to try to ruin your season. And the Braves are at least on Friday night letting them do that. It's again, it's it's magnified because it's happening now. But this is the same thing that's happened all year long against teams like this. And yeah. the Braves just haven't been able to get it done when they need to. And you had the opportunities. Opportunities were there. It's another one of those games where it feels like you outhit your opponent for the most part. Yeah. I feel like you you pitched well enough to win. And the other team, the other team comes away with the victory. It's just it's unfortunate, but it's it's been the 2024 season. Yeah. I mean, quite the turnaround for a Braves team that just won a game 15 to 3, a Marlins team that just got absolutely walloped by the Dodgers, who scored 20 runs against them in the finale of the series not 24 hours ago. But Miami, let's talk about it. They jumped on Charlie Morton for three runs in the first inning. He didn't get hit altogether that hard. There was a lot of well-placed balls, that kind of thing. Not a ton of swing and miss, though, from Charlie. I think he made a couple of mistakes over the plate that were put in play, and obviously that's all part of the equation as well. And, you know, six innings, four earned runs. I mean, it's not ideal. It's not awful. But, again, the Braves' offense was unable to help him out, and that, as much as anything, 
is the story of the 2024 Braves. Even if they pitch well enough to be in a game, their offense just isn't able to overcome it. And in this case, it was a three-run first inning by the Marlins. What did you see on that side? You know, it's just one of those things with Charlie Morton. We talk about it. It seems like there's at least one inning, if not two, in every game where things just get away from him. Command, just some bad luck, some walks. He had trouble with walks, and this one had four of them. And it just came in the first inning this time. And it puts you, you know, right behind, as you said, coming af- after that after that big win in, in Cincinnati, those two big wins. And then to come out and then give up the lead right away like that just kind of kills what momentum you have. But, you know, to be able to, to bounce back like that, you give them a lot of credit. I mean, to go through six innings, I was surprised they brought him out for, for the sixth inning. I was, I was sitting there advocating, get somebody ready after he let up another leadoff base runner in the fifth inning, which seemed like he let the leadoff runner on in just about every inning. Uh, but I, I was ready to pull the hook then. And so for him to be able to get through six innings, give the team a chance. And uh, look, you, I know a lot of people out there are kind of tired of hearing the exit velocity stat. The Braves pitchers gave up four hard hit balls on the night, all coming from Charlie Morton. Michael Harris had three himself. So Lair had three himself. Arcia had three hard hit balls himself. I mean, it's, Again, it's the story of 2024. You feel like you're just not getting rewarded and nothing is going your way. Yeah, a lot of Adam balls this year, that's for sure. I mean, Jorge Soler came up in probably the biggest spot, put a huge swing on one with the bases loaded, drove it all the way out to the wall in center field. As the old play or old story goes from Skip Carey, the old line, if he pulled it, he would have been in business, but he didn't. It was a sack fly. I got the Braves on the board, but unfortunately, that was just an example of 100 plus mile an hour exit velocity not finding green and not rolling around for a while, not rattling in a gap. As Brian Snicker said after the game, look, we felt like we were a hit away, and they were several times in this game, especially in that big opportunity, but weren't able to get the multiple runs that you'd like to have when you load up the bases for sure. Braves offense, meanwhile, coming off that huge win over the Reds, six home runs, and proceeded to leave eight men on base and go hitless with runners in scoring position. Again, the Solaire sack fly, that brought in a run. But again, Jake, how many times have we had to look at those two stats, especially together, leaving a bunch of men on, having chances, especially in a one-run game, and not getting hits with runners in scoring position? That is also something that would need to go on the proverbial tombstone. And it's something that just goes along with this 2024 season. I mean, this game encapsulates the 2024 season in my mind with everything that we're talking about, losing a close game, not being able to come through with the clutch hit, having a lot of hard contact that you don't get rewarded for. I mean, that is the story uh, along with the injuries of this 2024 offense for this team. And it's just at some point, you kept hoping they got to get over that and they have to punch through and they just couldn't. And that's so Lair ball. I was listening on radio at the time. Ben's not one that gets fooled very often. He thought that ball was gone when he made contact. And it sounded like he thought so Lair did too, but it wasn't meant to be. And again, it's a, it's a sack fly and you're, you're glad to at least get something in that situation. Cause this Braves offense has failed many times in that spot this year. But again, it's just, you just missed that big hit. You just missed you know, not even just taking a lead, but but putting a big number on the board. And that was just a case in this one. They were able to scrap across one here, one there to stay in the game, but just weren't able to get that crooked number. No, and those ones that came across, in addition to the Soler sack fly, were a couple of solo home runs, one from Orlando Arcia and one from Ramon Laureano, who continues to contribute to the Braves in his playing time as well. But just not enough and unable to get guys on base before it and unable to get those kind of hits with runners on base in any uh, general, however it comes together. They're just not able to string it all together and get the big hits when they need them, whether they leave the park or not. You'll take them in whatever shape or form they come in, but they weren't coming on this night. And, of course, the Mets lost to the Phillies, as we talked about, but another example of not making up ground, even though you're not losing any with this one, what you're losing out on is time, and time is running out. As you pointed out earlier, and, and I'll co-sign on it, this is the product of losing so many winnable games to the point where now you got to feel like your back's kind of against the wall, or if it didn't feel like it before this game, it certainly has to feel like it after. It does. And now you got two left with Miami. Obviously these, they were all three must win. Every, every game is must win, but uh, you cannot go into that Met series. That is your, that is your best hope right now. And I know the Diamondbacks are in the same spot. They're two games back, both of them, but you still control your destiny because of that, Met series, but you cannot fall back anymore. And again, because of what's happened this year, and look, we can make excuses about the injuries, but it's these types of games that the Braves have failed to find ways to win that have put them in a spot where they have to win pretty much every game yeah. down the stretch here. 
Yeah, I mean, you look at these two rosters and you say which one of these teams has more major league talent, more proven talent, more star players, however you want to look at it. It's the Atlanta Braves. They should be able to win games like this. It doesn't mean you're going to win every single one of them. And look, I think we all understand that you can't just sweep a bad team in three games every single time. You'd love to. And when you have those seasons where you do dominate a team like that, which the Braves have done against the Marlins in the past, that's certainly great. But this is just not a club that has felt like itself a lot this year. And whether you want to call injuries an excuse or a reason or a combination of the two, it's certainly a factor in why the Braves find themselves where they are. But they've had opportunities. They continue to have opportunities. They've been unable to cash in on those on an almost nightly basis. We're going to take a quick break. We will talk a little bit more about what went on with the offense. Of course, break down the start for Charlie Morton and look ahead uh, to what is going to be a pivotal, crucial, must-win game two of the series with Max Fried on the mound. And we'll discuss the return of Ozzy Albies, who was back in the lineup after missing two months with a fractured wrist. All that's coming your way as the Braves postcast continues. Passion, drive, and patience, the formula for winning championships, is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. With superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you are burning rubber and not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. That's ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is available only to U.S. customers. Let's look at the line score and the box score for this one. Unfortunately, it is my duty to let you know that the Braves lost this game by a 4-3 score. And despite out hitting the Marlins in this one, Braves are now 83 and 71. Marlins, as I mentioned earlier, 57 and 97. Could very well, and you would imagine over the next week and a half, uh, be flirting with 100 losses. I mean, they are already in 40 games under 500 and coming off an absolute shellacking by the Dodgers. They jump on the Braves early for three runs in the first. And Atlanta with three runs, nine hits, no errors, and eight men left on base. The Marlins, four runs, four, excuse me, four runs, eight hits, two errors, and seven men left on base for them. The loser, Charlie Morton, drops to eight and nine. Uh, Beazzo picks up the win. He is now three and four on the year. And a save goes to Tinoco, his second of the season. Uh, Charlie Morton in this one, six innings, four earned runs, seven hits uh, to score those, four walks as well, and three strikeouts for Charlie, who also uncorked a wild pitch. And that's unfortunate because two of these walks were actually pretty costly as one of them ended up scoring in that three-run first inning. And then Connor Norby with a walk, a stolen base, moved to third on a fielder's choice, and a wild pitch scored him. And that was the difference in this game that happened in the fifth inning as the Marlins were just able to add one more and keep the Braves at an arm's distance, at least for most of this game, and score just enough as Atlanta wasn't able to uh, to cash in on its opportunities. But those are the kind of things that are really frustrating, Jake, when you look at you know the little things, the margin of error being as slim as it's been for Braves pitchers and for Charlie Morton. A couple of those walks were really costly. It was. And you look at the start for Char Charlie, and that's the, the one thing you're going to point out the most. Obviously, you gave up the seven hits, but no home runs, so you can limit that damage if – you don't walk a bunch of people. And he walked four, and as you said, half of those came around to score, and you end up losing by one run, so it ultimately cost you the game. But, I mean, you look at everything else in Charlie's line. It's an 80.1 mile-per-hour average X velocity against, like I said, only four hard-hit balls. He was not giving up a ton of hard contact. It's just the walks, uh, the wild pitch, as you mentioned, and those things just really come back to bite you in what's you know a close game. And, again, we've talked about it with his pitching staff. We've asked them to be virtually perfect for yep. five months of this season. And you know that's not going to happen every time. And we've talked about Charlie Morton. Look, he's been good. He was on a great seven-game stretch coming into this one. He had been really good. But you know at some point a pitcher is going to have a little bit of an off night. And, you know, six innings, four earned. I guess you can call an off night for what's your fourth most, if everybody's healthy, your fifth starter. Uh, you know, still gets 12 lifts, still, you know, his throws 18 called strikes. So, again, it's it's not the worst night in the world. But when you can't count on your offense to bail you out of some of these games, going up against a pitcher who's averaging 89 miles per hour on his fastball, it's just – it's tough. And, again, those little things come back to bite you. And those two walks, ultimately the difference in the game. Yeah, and the Marlins ended up using, what, four relievers who allowed just two hits and one walk over the final – 
uh, what, what is that? Three and two thirds in this uh, in this game. So not a lot of opportunity. They got a little something going, but then the Marlins were able to, you know, pun intended, wriggle off the hook with all of those. Uh, to go back to Charlie, though, obviously some things he'd like to do better in this one. The walks would certainly be one. The wild pitch, untimely as well. But Atlanta couldn't do much at the plate. And I think that's kind of the story. You were already getting to that. Uh, Jorge Soler, we talked about the sack fly with the bases loaded in the third. Then you got a solo home run from Orlando Arcia in the fourth inning. Ramon Laureano won in the sixth inning. Uh, Laureano has been uh, quite the contributor as he has managed to get himself some regular playing time here. That's his 10th home run of the year. Nine of those with the Braves for Orlando Arcia, number 17 for him. Uh, I made this, uh, I guess, observation, if you want to call it that, on social. I don't know if you saw it or not, but is it just me or does it feel like Orlando Arcia has had more at-bats with two on and two out in the second half than just about anybody I can remember over any stretch of time? I don't care how big or small the sample size is. It feels like every single night he's got one of those chances, and as we've talked about uh, a lot, he has been one of the worst hitters in the league with runners in scoring position, and of course with runners in scoring position and two outs, it ain't going to get much better. It's either him or Sean Murphy, it feels like it, and I'm sure it just sticks yep. out in our mind because, you know, we obviously as fans uh, like the torment, so we remember the bad moments, but it does feel like if there's a big spot in the game, it's either been he or Sean Murphy, and uh, Murphy obviously is struggling mightily at the plate himself right now, but yeah, RC even more so is just, yeah, there's no confidence in him right now when he comes to the plate, whether in himself or from a fan's perspective, there's just no confidence in a night where he hit a home run. And I thought he got another one late in that game. He got a little bit off the end of the bat uh, in the ninth inning there. He almost had a game tying home and he had three hard hit balls on the night, but you come up in that spot at that key moment where you're looking for a big hit and it's just, he gets outside of himself and it's, it's usually just bad at bats and it looks like there's no game plan and there's no confidence so yeah yeah it certainly feels that way that when there is that big moment and you're looking for a big hit it's it's unfortunately been arcia coming to the plate yeah we're gonna have to track a new stat inspired by chipper jones the uh, flip-flop to at bat ratio because i would imagine that orlando arcia might be leading the team and as you mentioned sean murphy's ratio they're probably not great either ramon Loriano was caught stealing on a strike him out throw him out double play in the eighth inning that was atlanta's last real threat in this one um, I know there's could be some frustration about why is he running there, but I, I tend to think that just about any time Sean Murphy puts the ball in play, it's on the ground, and it could be an, an inning-ending double play, as it were, or a double play, whatever the case was. I've lost track of the outs, and honestly, who cares at this point? But I can understand running Laureano in that situation, just trying to make something happen. It just didn't work out. Uh, but here's my frustration with this. You, an inning later, Michael Harris gets on to lead an inning, he doesn't try to steal. Nothing's put on there. And, and Ozzy Alves does ground into a double play, a guy that I know he's just coming back, but I feel like he's yeah. a guy that can put the bat on the ball and has the ability to do that more than a Sean Murphy does, who is going to strike out a lot. So, and again, I don't know if it was a called hit and run. I believe it was a three, two pitch. So maybe Lariano just kind of went on his own, taking a chance there, but the opportunity I think to do that was an inning before where you have a fast runner at first base, not that Loriano is slow, but you know, Michael Harris, a fast runner and a guy who can handle the bat a little bit better in Aussie Albies. I felt like that was the opportunity to put something on and try to, to make something happen. So that I just didn't, didn't really understand. Yeah. I feel like, and you're saying that one was the ninth inning, correct? Or no, the seventh inning when Michael Harris got the lead off single. Inning. It might have upped the pressure to try something because you didn't prior. I, I don't know. It's hard to pick apart the bones of these kinds of things. And maybe it's just, you know, feeling it in one situation, not in another. With Ozzy, I don't think you necessarily look at him as as much of a double play, um, you know, issue as Sean Murphy would be because Sean certainly does not have the general foot speed of most of the players on this team, let alone Ozzy Albies. But either way, uh, you know, try something, don't try something. It seems like. The Braves have ended up in this damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of situation, which is kind of the story of the 2024 club in a lot of ways. Uh, this offense, though, going from 15 runs one day to struggling against uh, Vallente Biazzo is absolutely baffling. It's not like he had overpowering stuff, but this felt a lot like the one nothing loss to the Reds. I know they scored three runs against the guy. Don't get me wrong. I understand they did hit him a little bit, but he was able to at least work out of trouble and keep the Braves from being able to truly tie the game or go ahead and the Marlins obviously took him out when they needed to but it just felt a lot like that where you're just watching this guy and thinking man this is a lineup that's you know took a lot of middle middle pitches or a lot of pitches that caught a lot of the plate especially in that first inning I think it was um, Marcelo Zuna with a big strikeout in that one where he just kind of felt like 
It's just about to be one of those nights with one of these pitchers that isn't going to overpower you, but for some reason he just baffles the Braves. It's one of these box scores that you look on, on Savant, and it's just how how do you lose this game? And, and there's been so many games like that this year where you look at a box score for the Braves and you're like, how do you lose this game? And, and Belazzo, I mean, he gave up nine hard hits. I already told you Morton only gave up four. He gave up seven hits, a walk, two home runs. I mean, you just look at that and you would think the Braves would have won this game by a ton. And here we are talking about another loss, but it just it feels like that's been the case a lot this year where you look at just all the underlying numbers and the metrics. You look at the box score and it, it tells one story, but the game you're watching tells another. And a lot of that just has to do with those little things within the game we talk about that the Braves just can't seem to execute as well as the other team. But again, yeah. this is this is not a pitcher that you would expect to to be able to handle the Braves lineup, especially after what you saw in Cincinnati. Now, very different ballparks. There's probably a couple of balls yeah. that were hit in this game for the Braves that, that are gone in Cincinnati that weren't here, but you got to play the conditions. You got to play, you know, obviously with, with where you, where you're at and the Braves just weren't able to, to get it done. Yeah. And situationally a lot left to uh, be desired. There is the Braves. Again, they left eight men on base and lose the game by one run. And I think we've talked about the ratio of runners left on base and losing by a run. I mean, that one in Cincinnati, what, three, four days ago where you lose it six to five and you leave 14 guys on base, you can point at everything else you want to, but it's going to be hard for me to overlook that as a reason why the Braves weren't able to get it done in that game or in this game as well. We're going to stick a pin in this and then come back and talk a little bit about the wild card positioning and obviously the return of Ozzy Albies, the lineup construction perhaps going forward. We'll see what that's going to be. I thought it was at least worth a conversation about how it happened in the return for Albies and we'll preview the Saturday afternoon game with Max Fried on the mound for the Braves as the postcast continues. You've heard us talk a lot about FanDuel, America's number one sports book, and we have something a little bit different for you this weekend. It's now through September 22nd. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a free three-week trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. Let me tell you, that's an absolute mouthful. And all you need is a Google account and a current form of payment, and it can cancel anytime. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to download America's number one sports book today. I'm just so proud of myself for not tripping over that read. Now the Braves would be proud of themselves if they could pick up some ground on the Mets. But I don't know that that's going to happen because there's been this trend, Jake, where if the Mets lose, the Braves lose. And this was one of those nights uh, the Mets got blasted by the Phillies 12 to 2. Atlanta, though, remains two games out with eight games to play for that third wild card. Arizona, obviously, a factor in this mix as well. We're in action late with the Brewers. But now you're just kind of looking at the fact that with the four teams and three spots, the math may not favor the Braves down the stretch, but you do have head-to-head with the Mets and the Diamondbacks and the Padres still have to go head-to-head before this thing is over, but you're running out of time, and time is the most precious commodity for this team, and uh, there's just no way to put any back on the clock or any more games back on the schedule. No, with only eight games left, you're two games back. It's not a great spot to be in. Like I said earlier, the only thing that gives you some hope is that you do have head-to-head matchups left with one of those th- teams in front of you, but it's been one of the better teams in baseball for the mm-hmm. last three months. So uh, again, not a great spot to be in. If you're the Atlanta Braves, that's why you could not drop any of these games to give you the best opportunity. It looks like the Diamondbacks are probably going to win on Friday night as well. So you fall three back of them that I don't want to say just completely eliminates you, but that makes that even tougher as that was another possibility for the Braves to get in. Uh, but certainly now you're just looking at that Met series, hoping that you go in there, with an opportunity, you're not too far back where you have to get a sweep of them. But uh, that is honestly the Braves' only hope here the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, it would be nice if you were able to finish off this series in Miami with a couple of wins and have the Phillies do their thing because uh, the Phillies in this whole you know equation, yeah, the wild card, it has nothing to do with anything that they're dealing with other than waiting to see who they're going to ultimately end up playing. But they are playing for home field advantage and having one of the best records in baseball, which means they're going to have to outdistance the Dodgers and the Milwaukee Brewers in that equation. And we'll see what this last eight or so games looks like for them. So it's not like they're just trying to lay it up and, you know, sit on the beach for the next eight days. They got to figure out a way to win a few games as well. So there is some value to this head-to-head matchup for the Phillies and the Mets on the side of the first place team as well. Yeah, there is. And, uh, you know, obviously with the Brewers are losing to the Diamondbacks tonight. That gives them a little bit more distance there. But last, I, I think coming into the night, the Dodgers and Phillies were tied for that top 
uh, record. So uh, again, and, and I don't think they clinched the division yet either. They just clinched a place a postseason berth. Um, but you know, that certainly gives the Phillies something to play for. And you hope that that continues to be the case for the next two days because the Braves certainly need some help, need the Phillies to at least win one more game. And if they can do that and the Braves can win the next two, again, I think you feel a little bit better going into that Mets series, knowing that you don't really have to sweep it. You can just win the yeah. series, own the tiebreaker, and you get even in the standings with them. You'd like to at least have that puncher's chance when you get into that three game series. And that's what the Braves are going to be fighting for over the next couple of days. They cannot afford another misstep in Miami against a club 40 games under 500. Putting that aside for a moment, Ozzy Albee's back in the lineup. Uh, honestly, I was a little bit surprised that he was inserted into the two spot. I don't know about you. I felt like what the Braves had going made a lot more sense. The fact that you're going to have right hand hitting Ozzy Albee's against right handers and left handers, whom he's handled very well from that side, but that's the limitation based on where his wrist was and trying to get back on the field in any capacity this season, which I still think was worthwhile. I was just a little bit surprised that he was put up in that spot, considering that even with a couple of good games down in AAA Gwinnett, it's going to take a minute to, no pun intended, get his legs back under. I posted this as soon as I saw the lineup come out, because it makes no sense to me, and I'm glad to have Ozzy back. And, uh, you know, why not? You want to try to get a spark offensively. It's a guy that can deliver that. But it's a guy who hasn't played for two months, a guy who is only able to hit right-handed right now, facing right-handed pitcher, something he hasn't done a lot of in his career, and you put him in the two hole and you take a guy out of there and Solaire, who you got to be that top of the order bat that gets on base and was getting on base and doing that and getting on a roll. And look, maybe nothing changes. Solaire went right. over tonight, but I, I just it it didn't make sense to insert a guy who's been out for two months, who's facing a righty, having to bat righty, something he hasn't done a lot, and taking a guy out of that spot who's been hot yeah. in that that role. Yeah. It just it didn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, I would not have messed with that at all. That's just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand that Ozzy's hit there a lot, and ideally, you know, when he's a switch hitter, I think it makes a ton of sense. Hell, I mean, when there's a lefty on the mound, I think it yeah. would make a lot of sense. But this just wasn't that case, and it just he's going to have to hit somewhere in an important spot. And the middle of the lineup is also important, but I was surprised that that change was made. Now, if, so, if Soler gets that ball over the center field wall, then I guess you kind of look like a genius because you have the right guy up there at the right time. And that goes with managing if, you know, if something happens here or there, it can make or break on how smart a, a hunch was or how smart your lineup is or whatever the case, but it just didn't happen for the Braves. And Solaire wasn't the only one. Ozzy Albies, obviously not the only one either, but unable to make a big impact in his return. We'll see how he lines up over the next eight games. If I would imagine if you're going to do it in the first game, it's probably not going to change too many times going forward. But what do I know? It's the 2024 Braves, and nothing goes according to the way I think that it could have, should have, or would have gone. And that is another story for another time. Braves flat out needed to sweep the Marlins. They uh, they did not. They cannot. Not beating the sub-500 teams has taken its toll all year and continues to right down to the wire. Max Reed will be on the mound looking to even up this series against the Marlins on Saturday afternoon. He is 9-10 and 10 with a 349 ERA on the year. Right-hander Adam Aller will be on the hill for the Marlins. He's 1-4 and four with a 540 ERA. It's a 410 p.m. Eastern time first pitch at Lone Depot Park uh, down in Miami. But as we talk about so many times, a good start will go a long way towards helping the Braves uh, in their recipe for success. And it may be the understatement of the show here as we wrap things up. You need a good start, maybe a great start from Max Fried because the Braves need to win this game on Saturday and they need to win that game on Sunday to have themselves in position to go head to head with the Mets and make it count. And you know, glad to have Max Fried on the mound, obviously coming off a loss like this, having one of your aces go. And although the Marlins got to him a little bit his last time out, give up five earned runs against them. Uh, but still, Max Fried's a guy that that you want with your back up against the wall. He's somebody you want out there fighting for your season on with your season on the line. And hopefully he's going to deliver the Braves a good start. But again, it's, it's the story of the season. What are you going to get offensively from game to game? You just really don't know. Uh, but either way, having a guy like Max on the mound should certainly help. Yeah. Max Freed will be looking to even up his record and secure his 10th win of the season as he faces the Miami Marlins. Again, a 4, 10 PM Eastern time first pitch as Atlanta will look to even up this series and get itself back in the win column against one of the worst teams in baseball who you couldn't have picked a worse time to drop a game against 
in a series you really needed to sweep. That's going to wrap things up here on this edition of the Braves Postcast. Make sure you subscribe to Locked On Sports Atlanta on YouTube. Leave us those likes and comments. Share the show with a friend and subscribe to Locked On Braves wherever you get your podcasts. For Jake Mastriani, I'm Grant McCauley. We will catch you next time. And until then, so long, everyone.